All right, so we're gonna do here in part two, we're gonna look at the diseases of the arteries. Now with the diseases of the arteries, one of the most common ones we're gonna look at is hypertension. And you're gonna see that hypertension is gonna be the culprit for a lot of issues with the cardiovascular system. Now hypertension is going to be an indicator development of other things that are problems like cerebrovascular diseases. When we talk about cerebrovascular, those are things like strokes cardiovascular diseases like heart attacks, so the heart itself, and even some kidney diseases can be traced back to high blood pressure. High blood pressure or hypertension is a chronic disease. It's one that's gonna build up over time, and it is the leading cause of stroke and heart failure. Now, a normal blood pressure should be between about 120 over 80. Well, what do these numbers mean? The top number that we see here with the 120 is the systolic pressure. Systolic pressure is going to measure the highest pressure in an artery when the ventricles are contracted. So it should be the highest pressure. The diastolic or the bottom number is going to measure the pressure in the artery when the ventricles are relaxed. You'll notice this is not zero because there's still blood in those vessels, so there's still some pressure. Now, we do see that in women or especially people who are smaller or more petite, an average blood pressure may be a little lower of 110 over 70. Okay, but right now, what we look at as normal is about 120 over 80. High blood pressure is anything greater than 140 over 90. If the top number, the systolic number, is higher than 140, you have a blood pressure issue. If your diastolic is higher than 90, you have a blood pressure issue. Now, this right here is normally known as type 1 blood pressure. Type 2 is a little more severe. This is when your numbers are going to be higher than 160 over 100 on a regular basis. Now, what is blood pressure actually measuring? Well, it's reflecting how hard your heart is working. So the higher your blood pressure is, the harder your heart is having to work to pump that blood. Now, blood pressure is your cardiac output multiplied or times your peripheral vascular resistance. Now, that resistance is how well the blood is flowing through those vessels, those blood vessels. Now, cardiac output is going to be stroke volume times your heart rate. And stroke volume, how much force that the heart uses to contract, is going to be influenced by a number of things. First, the blood viscosity. How viscous is your blood? Okay, your blood is a little thicker than water. That's not just really a saying. It is a little thicker than water, but you don't want your blood like maple syrup. That would be too much. It's too thick. So we want it to still flow pretty well. We don't want it to be super viscous. We also see that that peripheral vascular resistance can affect how much the heart has to push, the blood volume itself, whether you have a lot or a little, and the venous return. How well is your body and your veins getting the blood back to your heart? Now, getting that blood back to the heart is important because this is going to create what we call an afterload. This is the pressure needed to eject the load of the blood. Well, how much load or how much blood is it going to have to have to eject? Well, that's determined by the preload. This is the amount of blood that returns from the body. And this is known as a Frank Stalling law. We don't have very many laws in biology. This is because a lot of stuff still has like a hole in it. So we have to leave it a theory. But this one is a law. This is saying that if the heart is stretched more, okay, because we're putting more blood in it, it's going to come back and contract harder. So the more it's stretched, the more it's going to contract. And guys, you can kind of think about this. If you put a rubber band on your wrist, if you only pull it up this far and let it go, it's going to hurt. But if you were to pull it up this far and let it go, it's going to come down with a lot more force. That's because you stretched it more. The same thing happens here with your heart. The contractibility of your heart is the ability of that muscle to actually squeeze and push that blood forward. The peripheral vascular resistance is going to be controlled by your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. This is if the blood vessels are going to constrict or dilate depending on which situation we're looking at. And then also how elastic are the arteries? Okay, that elastic layer and it being able to stretch and return to its normal shape, that is going to help determine this. And as we get older, guys, that elastic starts to wear out and this gets harder and harder to be helpful. Okay, so we see blood pressure can be affected like that. 
All right, so when we look at hypertension, guys, we can, we're can we going to focus here on what we call primary or essential hypertension. This is idiopathic. Idiopathic means there's really um, an unknown cause. We're not really sure what triggers this problem. However, we do see that it is gradual. It happens over time. There are some risk factors that ultimately contribute to this. One, of course, is heredity. If you fill out kind of your medical history and you have a ton of individuals, especially in your immediate family who have hypertension, there may be a good chance that you have some genes that could lead to that. Also, though, diet. Okay, if you have a high fat, high salt diet, it could obviously affect your blood pressure. Age. This is a degenerative disease, which means that as you get older, it does get worse. Obesity, if you are more obese or overweight, it can affect your blood pressure more, as well as smoking and stress. These are all risk factors. Now, how do we treat hypertension? Well, we can use antihypertensive medications. Okay, we call those blood pressure medications. A big thing that really needs to take place is a lifestyle change. This includes some education about what you can modify and what you can adjust in your lifestyle to help lower your blood pressure. A low salt diet is helpful because the less salt you take in, the less water you'll retain, which will help your blood pressure. Stress reducing exercise is important. If we can reduce our stress and get some exercise where we work our heart, it's going to be beneficial. Smoking cessation. Stop smoking. Okay. It can actually help your heart more than almost any of this. And then also diuretics could be helpful because diuretics can help get rid of any excessive fluid that your body is holding on to, which ultimately could raise your blood pressure as well. So guys, some things to reduce hypertension and also cardiovascular disease is lose some of those extra pounds. I know easier said than done, but that could be very helpful. Again, though, once you get that off, watch that waistline. Okay, try to keep it under control. Exercise regularly. Now guys, it doesn't mean you have to do super strenuous exercise. This could be simply 30 minutes of walking every other day or even just three times a week can really be beneficial. Eat a healthy diet. Guys, it's not good to necessarily deprive yourself of all kinds of stuff, but make sure that you're making some healthy choices. Reduce your sodium or salt intake. Limit alcohol consumption. Now you'll notice it didn't say stop alcohol consumption, but again, it has to be in moderation. Avoid tobacco products and secondhand smoke. Reduce your stress. Find something that helps you relieve stress. Monitor your blood pressure. Regular doctor's appointments can be super helpful in catching some of this hypertension issues. And get support from family and friends. The more support that you have that is encouraging and is keeping you going in the right direction, the more likely you're going to keep these changes up that will help reduce your risk. All right, so we're going to switch gears here, but we're still talking about diseases of the arteries. And we're going to look at what we call arteriosclerosis or arthrosclerosis. This is going to be a loss of the elasticity of your arteries and a thickening of that artery wall. A lot of times, guys, it's called hardening of the arteries. The arteries are losing their ability to have that stretch and, and return, and so they're hardened and not able to move like that. Now, this is due to a buildup of a substance called plaque. Plaque is a deposit of fatty or lipid material that starts to accumulate in the walls of the artery. Now guys, the walls of the artery are smooth just like they are in the heart with that kind of endothelium that's there. Reduce friction and allow blood to flow through easily. The problem is, is if something gets damaged in there, if it gets roughed up in any way, we see that this fat can start to accumulate. And over time, it can actually start blocking that blood vessel to where the hole gets smaller and smaller of how much blood can fit through there. This is ultimately going to affect the blood pressure as well. The more and more it's blocked, the more and more issues you're going to have. If this vessel is on the heart itself, we would consider this a heart attack once they no longer are getting blood through there. If you've ever heard of somebody who said, yeah, I went to the doctor and um, they told me that I had a blood vessel that was 80% blocked. This is what it's talking about. That blood vessel only has 20% open for blood to flow through, which means that the tissue on the other side is suffering. It's not getting enough oxygen. It's not getting enough nutrients. And so we need to go in and fix that. Okay, so this is the idea of the hardening of the arteries. Now, some of the arteries that are affected are the coronary arteries. These are the ones that are actually servicing the heart and they can result in a heart attack. 
The cerebral arteries, which are the ones in your brain, which can cause strokes. The aorta itself, which is the main blood vessel off of the left side of your heart. And then also the peripheral arteries, the arteries that are going to the whole rest of your body. Now here, guys, I've listed the risk factors, but I've put them into two groups, the ones you can control and the ones you can't control. The non-controllable risk factors, guys, are your heredity. You can't change your genetics, your age. No matter how often you want to have your 10th, uh, 31st birthday, it doesn't matter, okay? You're still aging, your sex, and also diabetes. Now we can control diabetes to a point, but we can't just cure it completely. And so because of that, it's not something that we can control like we can on the other side. These risk factors that are controllable are like diet, sedentary lifestyle, you need to get up and get moving, cigarette smoking, stress, and hypertension. Now to diagnose arthrosclerosis, we see that we're gonna check their blood pressure we may do an arteriogram where we're going to get a picture of what those arteries are looking like, an x-ray and maybe even a Doppler. Now, how do we fix this? We're gonna need to figure out how much of the blockage is there. If the blockage is not complete, we can maybe actually put a stint in, which is like a little um, almost spring that we can put in that opens the blood vessel up. This might allow for us to be able to clean out a little bit of that plaque and restore some of the blood flow. If we're not able to put that stent in, we may have to bypass the blockage completely. Okay, so if I have the blockage here, I may have to put in a bypass so the blood can go around the blockage. Kind of like when you have to take a detour. You may eventually be able to get to where you wanted to go, but you may have had to take the long way. Same thing here. Okay, this is where we're gonna have to go in and actually put in a graft of another blood vessel and bypass the blockage. All right, so let's talk specifically about if these blockages or these issues happen in the peripheral arteries. This is known as peripheral vascular disease, and this is called, caused by the arteriosclerotic plaque that happens in the arteries, specifically to those arteries supplying blood and nutrients to your legs. Now, what can happen here is what we call intermittent claudication. With this, this is where muscle cramps are relieved with rest and increased with activity. So intermittent means that it's gonna come and go. So this blockage is gonna affect you when you're active because your muscles are requiring higher oxygen when they're active. But when you rest, we see that the kind of constriction and the supply of oxygen can be restored and so then your muscles start feeling better. They're not cramping as much. Now the main treatment here is what we call an endoartectomy where we're gonna go in and we again are gonna put stents in or we may have to bypass that blockage. Now if we don't get this bypassed quick enough, necrosis can occur. Now necrosis means that tissue starts to die. If that tissue starts to die and gangrene and all starts to set in, then amputation and resection of taking out the dead material is gonna have to happen. All right, so restoring the blood flow is what we're gonna to try to do first, but if it's too long to do that, we may have to do an amputation or cutting out that dead tissue. Another thing that can happen when there's a hardening of our vessels or when our vessels start to become damaged is an aneurysm. An aneurysm is a weakening in the wall of an artery, and this leads to that artery starting to bulge, like you see here in this picture. Now, it could bulge on just one side or both sides, but we see that the sides of the artery are weakened to where we see a bulge. Now, the bulge is not necessarily an issue until it starts to fill with the fluid until then it ruptures. When an aneurysm ruptures, the individual can bleed out really quickly depending on where the aneurysm was located. And guys, the aorta is the most common location. And the aorta is that biggest area, okay? That biggest blood vessel to your whole body. A thing that's crazy about an aneurysm is it's usually asymptomatic. They don't have any symptoms. And so if we find an aneurysm before it ruptures, it's normally an accident. We accidentally found it because we were looking maybe for something else. Right, And since it's asymptomatic, people think, well, I don't need to get it fixed. No, you do, because if it ruptures, it could kill you real fast. You could bleed out really quickly. 
And so we need to be able to get that fixed. So even if you're feeling good, if they find an aneurysm, they're going to need to go in and surgically fix it. Well, how do they fix this? Well, they repair it. Okay, they're going to graft and kind of reinforce that area. They may even put a kind of clip in to help reinforce and put a fence there so that that area does not rupture. Okay, so it's like reinforcing that fence to allow the blood flow to continue without a breaking or rupturing from taking place. Coronary artery disease is going to be narrowing of the arteries that supply the, the actual myocardium, which is the muscle of the heart. So this is still a narrowing and an issue within the blood vessels, but we're specifically talking about the ones that are servicing the heart itself. This is the single leading cause of death in the United States. Again, it is commonly due to arthrosclerosis, that buildup of a plaque. However, there are a couple of other ways that this can be blocked off, and we can see it down here at the bottom. It could be due to a thrombosis. Thrombosis is a blood clot or an embolus. Now an embolus is any kind of blockage that can take place. So it could be a blood clot, but it could also be a fat globule or it could be like an air bubble. So anything that's going to block that vessel would be what we call an embolus. Now progressive narrowing of the vessel could lead to ischemia of the heart. This could give us some symptoms like chest pain. This could give us kind of a precursor that a bigger heart attack is going to happen, okay, because when that tissue starts to die, scar tissue fills in because muscle tissue cannot regenerate, and guys, scar tissue doesn't act like the original tissue, and so the heart will be weakened if it starts losing some of the, those muscle layers. Now, coronary artery disease ultimately leads to a myocardial infarction. Myocardial infarction is the medical term for heart attack. Diagnosis for a coronary artery disease is history, an electrocardiogram, so an ECG, and then also an angiogram. Now guys, when we do an angiogram, what they're gonna do is they're gonna go in with the camera up towards the heart and look at these vessels. While they're in there, if they find that there's a blockage, they're also going to work on trying to fix them. And so with the angiogram, they can use a little balloon to open up the vessel. They can also place the stents. But if the blockage is too severe, we're going to have to do something different. So treatments are aimed at increasing the blood flow and decreasing the oxygen needs of that part of the heart. Angina is treated a lot of times with vasodilators like nitroglycerin. Angioplasties may need to be done where we're going to have to bypass parts of those vessels that are maybe blocked. And this is known as coronary artery bypass grafting. A lot of times we call this a cabbage type surgery. This is open heart surgery. Okay, if the blockage is too severe and a stent won't work, they're going to have to go in and graft some bypasses. So if you've ever heard of somebody who had triple bypass surgery, that means they had three of them that they had to bypass. A quadruple bypass surgery was four. Now another thing that the patient can do though is they can start to reduce their risk for developing those plaques. What are some things they can control? Well, we've talked about that already diet, exercise, and they can stop smoking if they smoke. These are things that they can modify which can help prevent them from having another heart attack or another buildup of major amounts of plaque.